This is 7.3. We're talking about the sampling distribution of a sample mean. Uh, so the first part here says, based on previous simulations, what do we know about the shape, center, and spread of the sampling distribution of a sample mean? So remember, that's if we have all of our sample means, x bar, stacked up into uh, like a dot plot. So in 7.2, we did everything for sample proportions, p hats. Now we're doing sample means, so x bars. So let's start with uh, the shape. So for x bars, we know the shape of the distribution uh, can be approximately normally distributed, uh, and there may or may not uh, be some conditions that go along with that. We'll get to that in just a moment. How about the center? Well, just like for sample proportions, the mean of our x bars, the mean of our sampling distribution is centered exactly where we want it. So we can say the mean mu sub x bar was an unbiased estimator of mu, the true population mean. That means the mean of the distribution was centered exactly at the true population mean, which is mu. So we can say the mean of our sampling distribution is exactly equal to the true population mean. So we've got shape, we've got the center, and then the spread, it's the same trend as it was for the p-hats. As the sample size increased, right, little n, the sample size, as that increased, the standard deviation, which is our measure of spread, decreased. So what are the mean and standard deviation formulas for the sampling distribution of a sample mean? And maybe the bigger question here, are they on the formula sheet? Well, the answer to that would be yes. So they are actually on the AP exam formula sheet. Uh, so the mean, we already know. The mean of this distribution is equal to mu, the true population mean. The standard deviation of x bar, so the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, we don't know that one yet, but that one's actually not too difficult. It's just the true population standard deviation divided by the square root of n, which is the sample size. So that reason, right, if it's being divided by square root of n, that proves that when our sample size goes up, we're dividing by a bigger number. So this value, the standard deviation of x bar, goes down. And to be clear, that's not the standard deviation of the sample. That's the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Uh, so we do have a condition um, for the standard deviation, and you should recognize it. it has to do with independence. And because most of the time when we do research, we don't sample with replacement, as long as our sample size is less than or equal to a tenth of the population, we are okay to trust this independence condition. So remember, we call that the 10% condition. So that is the same condition uh, as we saw for sample proportions. Independence will work. We can trust it as long as we're not sampling more than 10% of the population. And as long as that's verified, the standard deviation formula holds. Uh, the only other condition we have to check would be for normality. And for now, we're just going to say it depends. Can we, can we trust that the distribution is actually normal? Well, there's a couple different scenarios we're going to look at. I do want to be clear, though. The large counts thing, that doesn't apply here. The large counts condition only applies to p hats. Right, so sample proportions, that was 7.2. We're not talking about those right now. So that one, the large counts condition, where it was NP, N1 minus P, that doesn't apply here. That's for P hats. Okay, so let's look at the bottom of the page here. Uh, we have two diagrams. One is the population of household earnings and thousands of dollars. Um, and then we graph it against the percentage here. So this is the population distribution. It's definitely right skewed. And then this diagram, it says the mean household earnings if we did samples of 100 from this distribution. And notice this is way less variable, right? This is squeezed way down and actually looks pretty normal. 
So this is the actual population, um, and you might guess that household earnings are right skewed, right? You have some people who really make a lot of money out here really skewing that distribution. But then if we just took a bunch of random samples of size 100, our distribution starts to get stacked up right around the true population mean. Okay, so the question here, what is the shape of the sampling distribution of a sample mean when the sample size is taken from a normally distributed population? So that population isn't normal, but what if it comes from a normally distributed population? And I like to think about it as parents, right? If your parent population is normal, or sometimes I tell kids, hey, if you come from normal parents, I'm gonna make a pretty, uh, a pretty good guess that you're gonna be normal as well. Right? So if your parent population is normal, then the sampling distribution is going to be normal automatically. I don't care what the sample size is, if it comes from a normal parent population, the sampling distribution is going to be normal. And there's no further things that we have to check. So if you know the parent population is normal, you can go ahead and start using normal calculations. There's nothing else that you have to prove. So that is regardless of sample size. So just remember, if you come from normal parents, I'm going to trust that the sample that came from you, like the child, is normal. If you come from skewed parents, like myself, right, maybe all our parents are a little bit skewed, who knows. If you come from skewed parents, uh, we have to check a, a condition or two to make sure that the sampling distribution will actually end up being normal. So let's take a look at example one on the next page. It says, at the Pea Nutty Peanut Company, dry roasted shelled peanuts are placed in jars by a machine. The distribution of weights in the jars are approximately normal, with a mean of 16.1 ounces and a standard deviation of 0.15 ounces. Part A, without doing any calculations, explain which of the following outcomes is more likely. Random, randomly selecting a, a single jar and finding that the contents weigh less than 16 ounces, or randomly selecting 10 jars and finding that the average contents weigh less than 16 ounces. So which one of those would be more likely? And we know the mean of that distribution is 16.1. Standard deviation is actually pretty small. It's only 0.15. So which one of those scenarios is more likely? You find a single jar that weighs less than 16 ounces, or you randomly select 10 jars and the average contents of those 10 weighs less than 16 ounces. Well, I hope by now that one kind of jumps off the page at you. Um, between those two, we know averages are definitely less variable than individual observations, right? We might see some wild and crazy outliers as individuals in a single jar, but if we do the average of 10 jars, even those outliers will get averaged out and be closer to the mean. So because the individuals are less variable, excuse me, the average are less, are less variable than individuals, we expect the sample mean of 10 jars will typically be closer to the true mean. So we don't expect that average from the 10 jars to stray too far from that 16.1 number. So without even doing any calculations, we know that it's more likely that a single jar would be the one to weigh less than 16 ounces. OK, and then the last part of these notes, what's the probability of each of those events? And we can actually calculate that because well, we know a few things. It's a normal distribution for the population. Uh, we know the mean and we know the standard deviation. So we can do normal calculations in each of these cases. So let's start with the first one. Randomly selecting just a single jar and it weighs less than 16 ounces. So let me just scroll down here. So we're going to let x just be the weight of a single randomly selected jar. So x is our variable here. Um, we know that x is normally distributed with 16.1 as the mean and 0.15 as the standard deviation. 
if you want to write that whole statement out, feel free. I like to use the shorthand, right? X is approximately normally distributed with a mean of 16.1 and a standard deviation of 0.15. That sums it up pretty quick. So we're really interested in calculating what's the probability that X is less than 16, okay? Because we're supposed to find the probability that we grab a single randomly selected jar weighing less than 16 ounces. So what's the probability that X is less than 16? Well, we are pros at normal calculations by now. So let's go ahead and draw the curve, give it a label. We know the mean and the standard deviation. And we'll put the mean smack dab in the middle there. And then less than 16 means we'll mark a boundary at 16 and shade below that. And since we're really handy with the calculator at this point, we're going to go ahead and throw this in uh, our TIs. Using technology, the command normal CDF, the lower bound, well, the lower bound, this thing actually goes off here. So we're going to use negative 1E99. Upper bound is stopping at 16 for this red shaded region. And then give the mean and the standard deviation. And that should give you an area of 0.2525, so about 25% of the curve shaded at that point. Okay, and then the last thing we need to do is just give this uh, answer here in context. What does that mean? Well, that means there's about a 25% chance that we would randomly select a jar and we look at it and it actually weighs 16 ounces or less. So there's about a 25.25% chance of getting a random jar of peanuts that weighs 16 ounces or less. Keep in mind, that's just for one single jar though. The next scenario we look at a sample mean of 10 jars. And if we, if we go back here, we already said, we already said that the 10 jars are a lot less variable. So it's going to be a lot more rare to find a sample mean of 10 jars that are actually weighing less than 16 ounces, right? We already said that. So it's more common that you would see just the single jar being an outlier. All right, so let's, let's mark off. We did the first part. Now let's, let's look at uh, a sample mean. So X bar is our sample mean. That's the average weight from a sample of 10 randomly selected jars. So in the first part, X was just one single jar. And then we looked at the distribution of the jars. Now X bar is a sample of 10 or it's the mean of a sample of 10 randomly selected jars. So I know the population was normally distributed, but is the sampling distribution of X bar normally distributed? And if you remember what we wrote on the previous page, it absolutely is, because this sample mean is coming from a normal population. So it has normal parents, therefore its distribution must also be normal. So since X bar comes from a, normal distri a normally distributed population, it's definitely normal. And as far as the independence goes, well, 10 times the sample size, so 10 times 10 in this case would be 100, is definitely less than the entire population of uh, peanut jars at this factory. So uh, we're good with both of those conditions. It's definitely normal, and independence is definitely good as well. The 10% condition would also hold. So, we know the sampling distribution of X bar is normal. The mean would be centered at the true population mean, right? That's the one that's on the formula sheet. So the mean of X bar would just be equal to mu, so 16.1. And the standard deviation, we, have to, we, we should calculate a little bit, right? So we have to take the population standard deviation, which was 0.15, and divide it by the square root of n. Oh, that's not quite right. Uh, we want population standard deviation divided by the square root of n, which the sample size is 10 in this case. <clears throat> that should give us 0 0.047. All right.
right, so let me just make some room here, scroll down. Um, so now we can find what's the probability that we get a sample mean that weighs less than 16 ounces because we know it's a normal distribution and we know the mean and the standard deviation. So let's go ahead and draw the normal curve here, label it with the mean and our standard deviation. Mean goes smack dab in the middle and then let's mark off our boundary here of 16 and shade all the stuff below it. So a sample mean weighing 16 ounces or less here. Uh, so again, let's go back to the calculator. Using technology, the command will be normal CDF, lower bound, uh, it's going off the curve there, so some negative infinity number, right? Some big negative number. So negative 1E99 for our lower bound. Upper bound would be marked off here at 16. So really, we're really just getting the area of this little red piece, put the mean in that we're using, put the standard deviation in that we're using, and that should give us our area of about 0 0.0167. So the last piece to get full credit for this question uh, would be to conclude what does this answer represent in the context of the situation. So it has to do with the sample mean. And apparently we're saying there's about a 1.67% chance, right? that we'd get a sample mean, right, the average weight of 10 randomly selected jars to actually be 16 ounces or less. So in the case of the sample mean, it's actually much more rare. There's only a 1.67% chance that we actually get a sample mean of 10 jars being 16 ounces or less. Whereas before, what did we have? A 25.25% chance for just one single jar to show up and be less than 16 ounces. So we're actually way below that for the sample mean, which is what we predicted and what we expected before we started this, right? Individuals are, can be way more variable than sample means. So it's much less likely that we get a sample mean to be less than 16 ounces. All right, so we talked about uh, the sampling distributions for sample mean. We talked about uh, the shape, the center, and the spread. And we definitely talked about what happens when they come from normal distributions. One big takeaway from this last example, you know that individuals have the ability to vary far more than uh, averages do. So an average of 10 jars, let's say. Uh, isn't going to vary nearly as much as just an individual jar's contents. That is all for these notes. I'll see you in class.